Okay, so it's six o'clock, so we're gonna get started. Uh, thanks for being here for our screening of Manzanar Diverted When Water Becomes Dust, um, followed by the Q&A with the filmmaker. Um, there's a big group gathered online as well, tuning in. Um, so this um, screening is part of a series called Movies That Matter, um, hosted by the Caltech Y, Caltech Center for Inclusion and Diversity, Caltech Public Events, and Caltech Sustainability. Um, so just keep your eyes open for the future um, Movies That Matter hosting, and thank you again for being here. Okay, so first we'd like to start with the land acknowledgement. Um, my name is Allison Tominaga. I work at the Caltech Center for Inclusion and Diversity, and I use she, they pronouns. We want to recognize the Gabrielina Tongva peoples as the original caretakers of this land. We are grateful to work as guests here in what is now today Los Angeles County, the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielina Tongva. We ask that we each tread lightly, humbly, and with open hearts. We pay our respects to the Gabrielina Tongva peoples, our ancestors, elders, and all of our relations, past, present, and emerging. We also want to acknowledge that inclusion means being intentional of how we are connecting with indigenous communities at Caltech and in the Pasadena community. As we are conducting research and working towards our goals at the Institute, let's think about how it impacts indigenous communities and their traditions. Good evening again. My name is Greg Fletcher. I'm program director at the Caltech Y, and I'm uh, so happy that you joined us tonight. We're uh, excited to see faces and to be out about doing, uh, uh, dipping our toes in the water of in-person stuff again. So uh, thanks for joining us on this. Uh, on behalf of the Movies of the Matter team, uh, welcome. I'm super excited to um, introduce our guests, uh, and I'm just going to Say we have our filmmaker, Ann Kaneko, and uh, Matt Crispin from Sustainability here at Caltech. And uh, I'm gonna move us right into Q&A. Uh, I'm not going to go further on intros just because I wanna maximize our time. They are certainly worthy of more words, but we're gonna move right into it. Uh, in terms of process, uh, Max is gonna get us started. And then if you have a question, just raise your hand and Elise will float to you uh, with the mic. And for our uh, viewing audience online, if you have a question, you can go to the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and input your questions there, and uh, we'll be reading those out as well. But I will turn it over to Max. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. And uh, thanks, you all, who are tuning in virtually, as well as those here in person today. Uh, and uh, we're extremely honored to have Ann, uh, the filmmaker of what you all just uh, experienced. Uh, and I have a list of questions here, but uh, hopefully I don't get through all of them because uh, I think uh, you all would very much like to have an exchange here with the, our wonderful filmmaker. And as Greg said just briefly, I manage the sustainability programs for the Caltech campus, and uh, I'll let Ann uh, introduce herself as well. Um, thank you, Greg, and thank you, Caltech. And you know, I know it's been a long process <laughs> getting the film here given COVID, so. Um, thank you for um, your persistence, and you know it's great to be here at Earth Day. Thanks, my to my cousin who's here, um, mm -hmm. who made the introduction a Caltech alum, as well as that whole arm of my family is all Caltech alum, because you know her husband, her son, her daughter's um, partner is also from Caltech, and, and my yeah my 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 you know, Ken's wife also. So we, we, we go, go Caltech. <laughs> and I also, I teach at Pitzer College, which is one of the Claremont colleges. So, you know, there's, I know there's a bit of a rivalry between Caltech and Harvey Mudd. So, um, but um, I'm a filmmaker based here in, in Tongva, Chumash, Kitchland, um, Los Angeles. I, you know, my family's been here for three generations, and um, you know, I, this is my third feature film. My first, fil my first feature was about um, undocumented workers in Japan. The second film was about um, um, art and censorship in the context of Peru, and then um, this film you just saw. So, I, and I have some other shorts. I made another 
short documentary before this that was about based on the diary of Stanley Hayami and um, who was it, it's similar I, I, I call it a, a, um, a it's like the diary of Anne Frank but by a, by a Japanese American person they were alive right at the same moment so um, anyway I think that's all I have to say in terms of intro just to give you a little background about me yeah Thanks, uh, thanks, Sam. That's uh, much better than I could have done with uh, just going through your website, which, uh, again, some very impressive films. Uh, invite you all to check those out as well, of course. And speaking of films, I, I wanted to ask, there's a statement made near the end of the film that talks about sort of ongoing efforts to have the you know, historic Owens Valley, uh, the hist history of it being a lush area with, with significant water, that to be sort of outlived by all of those who remember it, essentially, and to revise the history of the valley as sort of a persistent desert. Can you speak to some of the benefits and some of the aspects of, you know, color photography of filmmaking to supplementing memory in, you know, making sure that we remember ultimately what this valley was originally and how drastically it's changed over time. You know, it's, it's interesting. I, 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 I said, oh, no one's ever asked me a question like that before. So I think that's why you chose that question. But um, I did get a question recently about um, what the valley looked like before the LA aqueduct, because there really isn't that much documentation. I mean, there's there's, you see a few black and white photographs in the film, and you see that Bierstadt painting, which um, really, I think, um, a lot of, uh, you know, the rangers at Manzanar and Kathy were like, where did he t paint that from? Because it doesn't really match up to the, the way the mountains um, line up for, in re reality. So, um, but you can sort of see how it was sort of this swampy place. Um, but, I mean, I feel like, sure, photography is really important in documenting a place, but I, I also feel like, you know, because for the people who live there, um, that technology didn't exist. And so there, there are stories. There are the stories of the Native Americans, there's the story, like, you know, um, uh, Kathy's great grandmother and you know her family. These these stories, especially in Native American traditions, but I think in you know in all cultures, it's like the passing down those stories is really really important. And so there is that documentation, and I don't think that that should be you know dismissed because you know I think that we now kind of rely on this kind of visual documentation since we, you know, we're a culture where cu cameras are so, you know, prolif ev everywhere there's, there's such a proliferation of cameras, um, especially with cell phones that we all, um, we, we depend on that as sort of proof. But, you know, I do feel like story is important also as a document, as a, as a, as a way of preserving history and memory because an image can't capture the feeling that you have for that place or the perspective that you have for that place. And so, I mean, certainly color photography is important, but it also, you know, as I'm sure some of you are photographers, it's like an image, you know, depending on the lens, depending on the framing, it, it's very different. And so that's where you know, it's together with other elements that I think it, it kind of can preserve w how we experience a place and a, and a, and a history. Any, anything from online, Greg? I, I do oh. have a couple. Oh, but there's a question here. Go here first. Okay, hello? <laughs> okay, 
Um, I was wondering, like, I guess related to the, the issue of, like, there not being much documentation for when it was in a desert, has there been any effort to look into the, I don't really know how this stuff works, I'm, like, not a geology major, but the, um, is there any effort to, like, look into the geological record of, like, how, how much water was there in past years or, like, what the plant life was like and, like, reconstruct anything related to it just as, like, a, a way oh. of knowing what it looked like? Yeah. Like, like, just looking at, like, like, I don't even know if there's, like, tree rings or something that shows that there was water. I'm not really sure. Oh, no. There definitely is. There's definitely research that's, that's been done to look at, um, you know, uh, yeah, at, at the trees. At, you know, and I feel like I, I, I'm sure on in the at, in the ground, looking at the soil, that you can tell these things. I'm not a scientist, though, so I I I am no expert on that. But I I'm sure that there is research about that. So. Okay. Uh, first one is a simple one. Uh, just someone requesting that you maybe share a little bit more about your original motivation or inspiration to make this film. What was it that stuck out um, to you? So, um, you know, I came, this project, this film uh, was a process of about, I don't know, five years, over five years. But I was, it, initially I was invited by, um, some colleagues who teach both at UCI and UC Riverside to participate in this humanities project to look at Manzanar as the site of intercultural and interfaith, um, you know, com you know, ga uh, as a gathering spot. You know, particularly the, Manz the Manzanar pilgrimage. I think there's there's all there have been there's been a uh, a large representation from the Muslim American community um, it, as well as obviously the Japanese American community. And so um, I think it was, they were particularly interested in looking at sort of these kinds of gatherings where different communities had come together. So they also were looking at um, Holi and um, Semana Santa in, in Santa Ana. Um, and so then I was like, hmm, Man the Manzanar pilgrimage. I mean, there's so many films that have been made about Manzanar um, and, you know, especially about the pilgrimage that I was like, oh, I don't know what I can bring to this conversation. But I, <clears throat> you know, was it really interested in the land, this place, you know, I think my family was not incarcerated at, at Manzanar, but, um, you know, the, the diversity of, of landscapes and places where Japanese Americans had been incarcerated. And then just, you know, this relationship to Native Americans, because, I mean, obviously we're all on Native American land, but, you know, these ties to Native American, these tribal lands was, you know, very apparent, especially in, in like Arizona, for example, where, you know, Gila River is on tribal land. Poston also, you know, the water infrastructure was constructed by Japanese Americans while they were in camp and is used by Native Americans now, you know, and the list goes on because they were all in these very remote places. And so I think it was that that sort of um, led me down this path of looking at the land. And um, I, um, you know, I've, I've, I'm sure many of you have traveled on the 395 going up to Mammoth. If you're skiers, you go up to Mammoth and you, you go through the, through the Eastern Sierras, this valley, and it's empty, right? And you wonder, like, how is it that this place is completely empty? And then you realize, you know, if you do a little research that, you know, the Department of Water and Power owns all this land, right? And um, Manzanar, I mean, I'd been there several times growing up, and, you know, you read the signs. You know, Mono Lake, of course, you read about how this was all impacts of, of LADWP. But it's kind of an abstract idea of how this place so far away is related to Los Angeles. And so I think that for me it was like, oh, of, of course, this is DWP land. And then I started to find out these really interesting facts about how, you know, this was DWP land that they, you know, that they used to make, you know, to build these camps on, you know, that 
you know, initially the, the, the US government wanted to put almost all the Japanese Americans in Payohunadu or the Owens Valley because it was a remote place that was far away enough but was also close to where the majority of Japanese American or you know a, a huge part of the Japanese American community was living on, in the West Coast. So, um, so all of these things it became it, I was just reminded of how these different communities and these different stories all converged very conveniently in this place. And so I thought, oh my gosh, what a great opportunity to take this deep dive into looking at our relationship to our water through these communities and through this history. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I was going to ask, how did you decide how to organize the story throughout the film and um, decide what you wanted to keep in the film and just the general order? Obviously, there's some chronological ordering, but there's also other decisions. So how did you? Ah, yes. The editing and construction of a documentary film. So, um, you know, editing and, and something, this is a very complex film in terms of trying to balance these three different communities, right? Um, and, you know, I think that early on in the editing process, I showed it to some colleagues who, you know, they're academics, some of them are his historians. And so they had this, they were like, I think you should, t you know, take more of a chronological approach to the film. And I was like, no, no, I don't really think that that works. Because it's really more about these relationships between these communities, right? Um, and it became apparent that early on that the real metaphor that was driving the film is this, is water, right? And water became a metaphor for how we would structure the film. And so, um, you know, and, and, you know, many documentaries are, are um, um, they're character driven, right? You follow the story of a character of some characters, and there's a and there's a arc, there's a story arc, and then there's an outcome, right? But you know, this film is not character driven per se, right? I mean, there's people in it, but in in my mind, and I think this was a process, you know, this is what we discovered through the process of of editing the film was that the real protagonist of the film was the water and the land. And so that was kind of the refrain that we would keep coming back to in terms of, of, of finding a way to structure the film. And so therefore it became apparent that it was using this metaphor for water and then also the, these different communities and the, and the stories of these communities it, it, it was about tracking that through the film. And so I think, um, you know, it, it's, it's also, I feel like with documentaries, one of the hardest things is to find transitions between ideas or scenes. And so because it is about, you know, it is intersectional, it's how these scenes meaning is made through the transition between one story to another. And so that's also became really, um, you know, important in terms of how we, we threaded our way through these stories. So, I mean, there were many versions of this film. There's a chronological version. There was a more sort of character-based version. But then that, too, it was like, well, this is not a character-based film. But then it became apparent that you know, because people were like, oh, you have too many characters in the film. It's like, you know, and these are sort of these conventions that, that are part of, of, of filmmaking. You know, it's like, oh, we want just a few characters that we can follow their story arcs. But, but you know, so we sort of streamlined some of the characters, but then it became important to like, okay, we need to show that these people are, are how, what the connections they are, that they have with each other so that you can see that these are communities. And so that's also, was also informed what kind of context was important for people to have 
in order to be able to follow the story. I, I know that's a very complicated answer to your question, but it gives you a little insight into the process. Great. Uh, another one from online. Uh, Mulholland's famous declaration is alluded to by one of the people in the film. Here it is, take it back. Uh, do you have any thoughts on imaginable means of reparations to indigenous people whose lives and culture have been negatively affected for so long by the diversion of water from now mm. what is called the Owens Valley? Well, I feel like, um, you know, DWP really has to, you know, give some water rights back to these people. You know, they don't have their water rights in, in, in Payahunadu. Um, and they haven't, in a really, um, they, they, there's these, this conflict still is ongoing. They haven't, there, there hasn't been a, a real solution made. And I, and I, I mean, I feel like they pay lip service to um, these communities, but uh, they also want control of that land. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I feel like, you know, they they need to deal with it in a in a in a in a more straightforward way instead of trying to brush it aside. Um, I, I, you know, and and it's it's it seems to me that they that they have sort of taken this practice of like oh sort of divide and conquer. You know, there are different reservations, so it's sort of these different tribes. They all have different needs. The the deals that were brokered back in the day and the, and the, um, you know, the agreements that were made all differ between these different tribes. So it's like they do, they, they all speak together, but they do have different needs. And so, you know, I think DWPs, um, you know, they, they're, they're, they have had said, okay, you guys all come together and then we'll talk to you as one. But that's really not fair to them either. So, I mean, I think that a lot has to be done to come clean. I don't know. And, and I mean, you know, there's li giving back land. I mean, that's sort of a movement across the country in terms of indigenous people and, well, give back water. I mean, I was just on a panel up in Portland and um, one of the other people on the panel He's, he used to work with water issues. Uh, now he's working in philanthropy, but he was working with water issues in the um, Pacific Northwest. But um, he said that his, his, part of his family, he's, I guess he's, he's, he's part of the Nez Pierce tribe in northern Idaho. And he said that they successfully negotiated to get their water rights back. And I was like, wow, that's really amazing because water rights, it's so complex because it's all based on need and demonstrating need. But they were able to work the legal system and, you know, sort of, because, you know, their population is only so much, but they were able to um, get their water rights back. And I was like, wow, that, that needs to be, that, the way that you did that needs to be, um, first, it, first of all, it, it has to be celebrated, and you know it needs that has to be uplifted so that other other tribes and other indigenous people are encouraged to sort of pursue that because it is very complicated, and you know it's a legacy of what's happened. So, yeah, and you talk about sort of reversing these injustices. One of the striking moments earlier on in the film is sort of the repeating of, uh, you know, very negative history in the sense that, you know, First Nations tribes who have seen their land stripped away uh, are now watching, you know, trucks and buses of Japanese Americans being, you know, taken away from their land and coming in. It's sort of a cruel repeating of history. And um, so how do you see us starting to, or, or continuing the trend, as you had just mentioned, of sort of reversing these injustices. And how does that happen, if we want to get a little more specific, how does that happen through filmmaking? I think that, um, 
you know, I mean, that's why, we, that's why I made the film, right? So that you can learn from history, because it's obviously we don't want history repeating itself. Um, but I think that um, certainly this moment is teaching us that we have to be in solidarity with other people, you know, other people who have suffered from injustices. It's like that's, you know, a way that we can hopefully begin to change things um, and to be able to recognize and be empathetic with other communities that have suffered. So, um, and it's, it's about education and being aware, I think, of what's happened so that we can be committed to making a better society. Obviously, the devil's in the detail, like what, what is a better society may var vary amongst all of us, but you know, at least to have that conversation is maybe a step in that direction, but um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, well, I, I will say they're very costly, so I kind of avoided the DWP. Oh, they, they for their oh yeah, definitely. So actually, um, the material that's in the film of DWP, I think we're using, we're claiming fair use for mar most of it because it is quite costly. I mean, I think there are a couple images that maybe we got. And then we also, um, a lot of, I, for example, the images of when they're blowing up the Alabama gates, like those we got from the Eastern California Museum because they had rights over those, those images. But, you know, it's so interesting because in terms of, I mean, if you're interested in sort of archival research, and this film certainly, um, you know, it, it was, it, it involved a lot of archival research, right? Um, I think, you know, although Japanese Americans were not allowed to have cameras in camp, you know, they, it, they were forbidden and banned when they entered, but um, it's ironically fairly well documented because the government was trying to justify what it was doing. So it had hired these um, WRA photographers like Ansel Adams, Dorothea Lange, Francis Stewart, Clem Albers to come and document the camp. So there's that archive and it's all public domain because it's, you know, the National Archives. Um, and then there's, and then there are people like Toyo Miyatake who really took it upon themselves to uh, document this experience. So he snuck a, he snuck a, um, a lens in and he built a camera and he made, he made some, he brokered a deal with the camp authorities that, you know, he could set up the shot and then he'd have a guard press the shutter so that he took these pictures. But, you know, I think that changed as camp went on. But, you know, so there's fair, and because that, that his history is recognized as being important, there's, you know, there's documentation and it's fairly accessible, right? Native American, much less so, right? And there's much less documentation. So that was like through family archives. Um, and, you know, fortunately the Eastern California Museum again had amazing images. And so it was through them mostly that, that I, you know, most of the images of the Native American community. And I, I, I will say that um, it was, you know, really important to get, make sure that geographically I, I, I had the right people represented, right? So they had been a huge source. And then with the, um, with, with the aqueduct, with the, with the water history, you know, early, the building of the aqueduct, well, that was, again, really important, Mulholland, it's an engineering you know, feed, so there's lots of documentation, even though it was a long time ago, right? Because this was a celebratory moment. But then the second aqueduct, you know, trying to find images, yeah, there's some, but it's also that because the history has been so fraught, it's not like they're trotting that stuff out there as much. So, um, and then it's like you have to pay for it if you get it from DWP, and so it's like, uh. So it was funny because I was almost felt like that history, even though it's more recent, was harder to access. So. Uh, you mentioned education, and I've got a great comment here and uh, and a question that I'm going to put together from online. 
Uh, this film should be required for anyone who turns on a tap or sprinklers in LA County. Uh, really powerful, <laughs> informative, and thought-provoking. Thanks. Uh, and the question, which is related, uh, what would it take to make this subject and this film a required unit in California history for all California high school students? Oh my gosh, I don't, I don't, I don't <laughs> control curriculum in the high schools. Um, but no, it's true. I mean, I feel like, I, I for one, you know, my daughter is 11. So she just went through, you know, that third grade, fourth grade, when you're supposed to learn about the missions. And then like the way they frame it with the, discovering California, the Spanish, you know, and, and I was like, and I feel like, you know, my daughter goes to school in Culver City, fairly progressive school, but oh my God, the framing of that history is still so wrong. So, um, I, I mean, I always feel like, oh, I've got to write them, but it's such a big treatise that I feel like I need to write. It's like, where do you begin? But it's true, I, I feel like, I mean, I, I lived in California and, like the, really what happened to, to Native Americans is not taught. It's really not taught. And I, and I feel like, you know, so many, I mean, it, it's like the celebration of Junipero Serra and, and it's like, mm, no, lots of people died. And then the way they were pushed out. And, and I think that, I don't think, Amer I don't really feel like Americans understand, like, you know, we, we have these, certain places where it's like, oh, there was a trail of tears. But there are a trail of tears everywhere. I mean, they just drove communities out of their lands and, and kind of pushed them to certain forts or encampments to sort of control certain, you know, lands that, 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 that people wanted to cultivate, right? So, um, you know, and even I was just up at Fort Tejon. Um, you know, we just had, what, took this trip to Yosemite and I was stopped at Fort Tejon and on the way, I was like, oh my gosh, I've never been and this is apparently where, you know, all these people were driven. So I thought, okay, I'll look at it. But the, the way that the history is written at this site is like kind of appalling because there's really no mention of the Native Americans who were driven there. And then it's, it talks about the you know, the fort as having been protecting the Native Americans that were in the San Joaquin Valley. And so I'm sure that there was people trying to take lands and there was conflict, but I was like, protecting them? I, I mean, I feel like that's a little bit of a misrepresentation of probably what had happened. I don't know the history specifically, but you know, there, there are Native American tribes in the area of Fort Tejon it's not their land, but they lived there because they had been driven there from other places. So it's just, you know, I think that all of us need to, you know, for, to, for educators to help press people to really, you know, teach this history. Well, we're coming up on 8 o'clock, and uh, so just if we could close with one more end. Thanks again for your time. Um, to those who visit Manzanar today, driving up the 395, something I plan to do, uh, what's the one thought or idea that we should carry with us on a visit? Well, now that you've seen the film, hopefully you can think of how this place is connected to us here in Los Angeles and you know, be grateful for the water that we get from there and the people who live there. Great. And uh, so thank you all for attending here uh, uh, in person as well as online. Thanks to Caltech Public Events, the Caltech Y, the Caltech Center for Inclusion and Diversity, and Caltech Sustainability, and to the sponsors, the Friends of the Beckman Auditorium, and the Caltech Employees Federal Credit Union. Keep an eye out for other movies that matter in this series, and uh, also to the rest of the events of Earth Week that end this Friday. So thank you all for attending. Go Earth Week! <laughs>